Hello and welcome to Skeindir Knits. My name is Ellie and I am a Norwegian living and knitting in London. And you can find me on Instagram as Skeindir and I am Skeindir Knits as a designer on Ravelry and also have a Ravelry group which is a great place to get in touch about all sorts of design related shenanigans. But anyway, let's get into this episode. Welcome, first of all, to new viewers. This is where I sit and talk about knitting for about an hour, maybe on a monthly basis. And to returning viewers, hi and welcome back. I have been to not just one, but two yarn shows that I hope to talk about today. I did hope to be able to record uh, each yarn show in a separate episode, but uh, someone managed to get COVID. Uh, luckily, between these two shows, I had time to both get COVID and recover from COVID. So before I get into my finished object, my works in progress, I do want to quickly run through the knit alongs that I am running currently. One is, of course, the year long garment cal of 2022, where you can take part as long as you make any of my garment patterns uh, during the year of 2022. However many garments of mine that you make, the more entries you get, and we will do a little draw of prices at the end of the year. The other little long is the festive yoke cal that I started last Christmas, and it will be running until this Christmas, the end of it, so that you kind of had time to start then. Uh, for those of you who are joining now, you can still join now. I will be doing a relaunch of the pattern actually in October, so that should be very exciting, but more on that then. Uh, the pattern itself is not really going to change, it's just that I have been knitting my yoke with you, and so now that I have finished it and I have photos, I want to do a little, you know, relaunch as it were, which those of you who bought the pattern will simply just get an update. <laughs> that's that's it. Thirdly, there is of course the Nordic Mitten Club. Now, those of you who have followed me for a long time know that I used to run the Cyber Mitten Club in 2017, 18 and 19. And then I had to have a bit of a break because I was finishing a PhD and it was a little bit too much to manage at once. But now I have returned with a different mitten club. So we're still in color work land, we're still in the north of Europe, but we have broadened out from the tiny little village of Serbu to most kind of sort of ish of, of northern Europe. So it's not just the Nordic countries, it's gonna be several different knitting cultures. So if you've been wanting to dabble into many sort of historical mitten knitting traditions, and this is definitely the club for you, I will link to all of that down below in the video description, as I always do. To those of you who have already joined, thank you so much. It's been a really fun launch. It's been fun to return to all this stuff. And you can still join, of course, if you haven't already. Anyway, that is my knit-alongs. I have one finished object that I worked on quite a bit before and during the festival in Hamad, which was called Stitchurama, that I gave a talk at. So I'll be showing you my finished item and I'll be telling you a little bit about the festival because it was a lot of fun. I'll be talking about both of these shows sort of interchangeably. Anyway, the revelation. The Kalashol. The Kalashol. Okay, this is not working out. I'm gonna have to back out of it. Also, recording under absolutely abysmal lighting conditions today because I sat here and procrastinated until the sun rounded the corner and made this so much more difficult than it could have been had I just started earlier in the day. That's on me. Anyway, anyway, <laughs> this is a Kala shawl. This is so gosh darn beautiful. The light, <laughs> the light is really not working with me today because it looks brown on camera, but I can reassure you that this is the most perfect shade of burgundy that has ever burgundied, okay? It is, by the way, I haven't even talked about what I'm wearing. Let's get to that. This is the Sinkestra pullover. It's one of my designs. It is the sort of pullover take of the original Sinkestra cardigan design of mine. And I kind of just felt like doing a different take. So I changed up the sport weight wool and spun non-superwash yarn that is Fenul with a superwash DK Merino. It might be blue face luster actually. Uh, so kind of your run of the mill hand dyed yarn. I happen to use yarn by Stranded Dye Works and it is so comfortable. The major change from cardigan to pullover is that the kind of elaborate neck shaping that happens at the same time as the sleeve and body shaping, you don't really have to do that because it's a boat neck, so that just kind of binds off here. I know a lot of people have like kind of boat neck skepticism, I know because I used to have that too, but I find that if the width is just right to kind of hand, hide any straps you may have here, uh, but not so narrow that it starts cutting up here, it is actually really comfortable. I'm really enjoying this neckline, I find it flattering and just 
it is just right. I find the 30 centimeters is kind of the sweet spot there, but that's just kind of my, I, th I find that works for a lot of people. Anyway, I'm just gonna give you a close up of the shawl so maybe you can get a more accurate sense of the color, maybe. So this is in John Arburn, usually knit by numbers DK Wade Falkland Merino. However, I used the version of this that is dyed by Viola. Uh, so it's just called Viola edition. Ignore the end. I do not weave in ends ever on time. I do it so eventually, but I just haven't yet. So hopefully that gives you an idea of this shawl in a little bit detail. And I shall give you one more sort of full view of this glory. It is massive. Um, I also run out of yarn. I was supposed to have quite a bit extra yarn in my four DK weight skeins. But I had to do a premature bind off without the pico edging because I was running out. It might have been a gauge issue because I do see that this has grown quite a bit after blocking. And the irony there that that was the issue when I was just giving a talk about gauge. It's not even irony, it's actually quite fitting because my talk wasn't really focused on you must get gauge or else you must must swatch or else kind of thing no it's more that the knowledge about gauge and how gauge works is empowering in your knitting and that is a great way for me to kind of assess why this shawl you know why i run out of yarn because what can happen when you just run out of yarn you start maybe assuming that the yarn estimate in the pattern is wrong or something like that and then it's just oh wait Maybe I used a too big needle size and then I ran out of yarn because gauge matters even in accessories because you could just run out of yarn if you make your shawl too loose. Uh, I'm not the first person that has happened to. But anyway, let's put the shawl on. It does not really <laughs> go with this color, I don't think. I love both of these colors. But I'd pair this with like a green jumper or something, you know, or just other shades of burgundy. <laughs> it's I'm not a stranger to that, but oh, the autumnal vibes from this shawl. Oh, the size of this is perfect because with triangle shawls, sometimes they're a bit small and you end up having these ends hanging up here, which is just asking for them to flop over here and then you're no longer really wearing your shawl. But these bits are getting in the way of my hair or the other way around, uh, are just long enough that they hang down here. Oh, and it's just right and it's warming my neck, but it doesn't feel like it's too, Strangling, it's just, you know what? If my shawl grew too big to have enough yarn because of my needle size, I am glad because this size is just right. It's not too big, it's not too small. It's, oh, it's so soft. Oh. Falkland Merino, like you just think Merino's Merino, right? No, there's very different Merinos out there. Like for instance, you've got things like German Merino, French Merino, that can be anything from kind of like toothy to at least a bit soft but rustic feeling still. And then you got, you know, those sort of superwash merinos that we're most familiar with. And then you got Falkland Merino, which is like butter. <laughs> like, I don't know why we say butter. Butter is kind of sticky. It's not sticky. It's just very, very, very soft. Once I've woven in the ends, this one shall be my autumn uniform. And my goodness, do I need it because it is cold. I famously do not often wear knitwear on the podcast because I tend to get myself so worked up that I run hot and then... I am just a sweaty mess and I can't be wearing it wear. But it's cold and we can't afford heating this year, so... Huh. Yeah, just wearing a lot of knitwear. Uh, by the way, if any of you are not in the UK, the pound has tanked because our... because this country's economy is just not being run by adults. And so if you want to get knitting patterns of mine that are a bit more affordable than usual, well, the pound is just like not really worth a lot right now. So I reckon all my patterns are going to be pretty cheap to those of you who are from anywhere else in the UK. So, and for those of you who are in the UK, it's just going to be the same. Um, so yeah, you can get yourself... Uh, I, I don't know how much you're going to save, but probably a lot. So, you know, if you want to help me with the heat at the same time... <laughs> that uh, god this is dystopian wow but it's definitely helping with my knitting mojo as we'll get to in a bit I'm just knitting things to stay warm at this point and to also just get all my burgundy yarns on my body um, so yeah well I honestly think I haven't mentioned the designer yet this is by Natasha Hornby. This was in Lane magazine way back when, one of my favorite issues of Lane and it's probably the most beautiful shawl that I have made 
it might even be my most beautiful piece of knitting made. I really wish the colour would come through a little bit better on here. I just feel like it's looking brown, but it's definitely got that extra kind of cool purple kick to it, that burgundy, at least my favourite shades of burgundy does have. But yeah, it is gorgeous. This broken rib pattern, that's sort of the main texture where this sort of cable lace chart pops in here and there, is, I'm, I want bro broken rib on everything now. I just want it on everything. Um, so if you're wondering what I sort of missed out on when I had to cast off too early, there was supposed to be like maybe a little bit more broken rib and then a pico bind off and there's like no chance that I would have enough yarn for that. I was even worried I had enough yarn to bind off, which I did. Oh, I keep doing this. I keep just like wanting to have it next to skin. It's, it's so, so lovely. Uh, there really aren't enough words. We're gonna have to arrange sort of like a petting zoo for this shawl so that everyone can feel it and squish it, which I kind of did when I was knitting on this at the Stitcherama festival because just everyone's like, feel my shawl that I'm knitting on, feel it, feel it, feel it. I'm a level-headed person, especially when it comes to knitting. <laughs> oh, oh, can we? Can we just talk about this shawl this entire episode? We don't have anything else. To, oh God, we have a lot to talk about. So I guess I'll put this one aside. This has been a wonderful knit. I really loved it. Kala Shawl by Natasha Hornby. Would highly recommend, highly enjoyed it. it especially in this super soft Falkland Merino yarn by John Arben and Viola. That's, mm, mm. If you can't get hold of the Viola colors, then regular John Arben knit by numbers DK should be fine. I think it's the same at the end of the day, so yeah. Now for some works in progress. I have worked a lot more on my Alicia Beth card again by Justina Lokowska. She now has sleeves, both sleeves. I think I had one sleeve last time. We now, indeed, have two. This one is, <laughs> I am feeling that this one's knitting up slowly simply because of, I don't know, I tend not to make garments on anything smaller than a 3.75 and here I am using a 3.5 and a considerably finer yarn and it, it shows, I'm feeling it. it. It feels slower, but I want, a sort of lightweight thin cardigan that isn't woolly as well. I have a lot of things like that already obviously and there will be more so I kind of want something that has like a slightly different purpose in my wardrobe for slightly sort of in-between climates which was motivating me to knit this cardigan but we seem to have skipped a season. I don't know what's going on but this is now again becoming a weather podcast where I was wearing bare legs. I, I mean I wasn't wearing. I wasn't wearing anything on my legs before I went to Stitrudama and, and Yarndale, the other show I went to. I was in my little short shorts and now I'm wearing double layers of wool tights. Um, there's supposed to be a season in between here where I get to wear my sheer tights and, uh, <laughs> and this type cardigan. Well, we've gone straight for thick wool jumpers, whereas before I wore like thin viscose dresses. Is this the weather gods? I have a complaint to make. But I don't have a complaint to make about this pattern. It is quite lovely. I am kind of freestyling it at this point that now though, I feel like I'm not listening to the pattern uh, much. I came up with my own sleeve decrease rate uh, for reasons. I'm continuing this lovely sort of fake cable pattern all the way down to the rib at the waist. I'm not doing any shaping. <laughs> I'm just kind of doing what I want at this point. But I did really enjoy the contiguous setup all the way from the beginning to the underarm. Um, can highly recommend. I thought that was great and that's kind of where we're at right now. I hope you can see it because I cannot. Um, yeah, it is knit in beautiful uh, travel knitter blue face Leicester nylon sock yarn. I have four skeins in the brambleberry colorway that I bought in I think 2016. <laughs> One of my oldest sweater quantities. This one might go into hibernation soon, given that my autumnal inspiration has been thwarted and I have to now knit everything in chunky woolly wools, I guess, because that's all, that's that's what this weather calls for. But, you know, layers, there's nothing wrong with layers. But I am enjoying this now. It's really nice to bring around with me to wherever, because now I have the pattern fairly well memorized. It's kind of like stocking it with like a bit of pizzazz, so, you know. It's kind of travel friendly and I did bring it with me to Yarndale. It just happened to not work on anything when I was there except one sock. And this is the sock that I worked on the Yarndale. We're kind of jumbling the order of things here just because it seemed like a good segue. Um, this is kind of leftover yarn. I have been teaching a 
a body to knit socks and he used up a considerable portion of my West Yorkshire Spinner self-striping signature four-ply yarn. Um, so I'm now basically using the rest to make myself some socks and I've sort of estimated the stripes roughly so that these will be identical, uh, not to his socks, just to my, my two socks will be identical to each other. Um, I am just binding off the cuff, which I could have done. Uh, I was doing it on the train back from Yarndale, but I was pretty exhausted at that point. It's practically done, which is good because I was a bit sloppy of, with packing away my three sort of wool socks in rotation that they have been a bit munched on and they're now living in the freezer. So I'm going to have to quickly whip up some socks that aren't like fancy pants lace stuff or, you know, samples that I tolerate a bit of wear and tear. So these will come in handy. I just need to get the other sock going as well and put in some heel in my other West Yorkshire spinner socks. So that's that. Uh, what's the method to the, you know, the sock in a sock knitting? I tend to use 64 stitches and 2.5 millimeter needles, which for me is like, I think a 32 stitch gauge, give or take. Uh, I tend to knit a bit tighter when I do short circumference knits, so maybe it's more like 34. I want them to be dense, but you know, they are stretchy because it's just stuck in it and sit sort of just right on my feet. Um, some other socks that I do, I tend to want them looser and work a bit more like slippers. When it comes to these stockinette socks, I just want them to snap on. Negative ease is key. That's that nice tough yarn. That's not gonna break too easily. It's different yarn, by the way. The um, self-striping and the solid blue are two different colorways of the same signature for play yarn. So yeah. Another work in progress that lives in this gorgeous fat squirrel bag that I, I love this bag so much and I'm so glad that I'm finally working on a project that lives in this bag because it's it's a great bag. Uh, fat squirrel bags is sold over in America so it's not something I can get my mitts on all the time so I am very excited when I can. And in here is a project we haven't seen in a few winters. Um, this is the Blomstenet pullover. This is a pattern from the third edition of Kofteboken. The convenience of having the book here, why not? This is Kofteboken. I bought all of these books. They are amazing books that both kind of re-releases old color work cardigan patterns known as Kofte from Norway. And they also make up some of their own, including this one. And it's just, they are so wonderful. They're always worth getting. And they always feel like such a community project as well, because I think it came from a online kind of scramble to try to find all the old color work cardigan patterns from way back when. And people collected them in these Facebook groups. And that's how the first book came about. Anywho, this is the pattern that I am working on. Hopefully it's sort of in focus, kind of. So you can see how it's spelt and everything, my goodness. I am not following the pattern, <laughs> not even the slightest. I adored the look of this jumper, but to me, that sort of traditional way of making these sewn in drop shoulder sleeve garments that, you know, kind of Kusikofta also is based off. I, well, I love that method. I mean, I used it here. I guess I have another preferred method at the end of the day that is top down and it's the same one that I used for the Islander, for instance, and Utra and do guide and a lot of them. I think I'm mostly relying on the Islander method. So the way that I did it is I cast on the full stitch count for the front and the back, which would be the same count, and just knit that in the round with steak holes here, here, and here. So these here would knit all the way to the underarm and then I bound off the steak and just continue knit in the round. Whereas that this one here, I would shape alongside it. So when that was cut open, you get a nice round mm -hmm. neckline. And then I pick up stitches around that neckline and I was gonna sew it down and then I had a change of mind and now I kept it the way it looks in the pattern and I'm not sure how I feel, but we'll look at it after it's blocked. And if I still don't like it, I might just rip out the cast on and sew it down and kind of hide a lot of the excess stuck in it on the inside because I actually didn't like how tight the neckline was. I thought I wanted it a little bit more open. So I picked up stitches a bit more away from the edge. This is where it's at. I don't think the neckline's too bad, actually. I think if I just get to block it, it will look quite quite nice. So this is the, the progress. We can see it's knit all the way down to here. Um, the only thing that's a little bit funny about this, again, this is why I love geeking out about gauge because that's the best way to kind of problem assess this. I was looking at it and I started to measure it across and I was like, it is measuring less than it should be. It should be measuring 
half of 115 centimeters, so kind of roughly 57 and a half centimeters. But it was measuring barely 50 at all. It was just like, or maybe it was 53 or something. I don't remember off the top of my head, but that is a lot less than it should be. And of course, there's a bit of a curvature on the side that will take out some, but it wasn't adding up. And yeah, turns out around about here, my gauge is one stitch too tight. I am aiming for a 26 stitch gauge, but I was getting 27 and that does add up. And I am very much opposed to this idea that if we feel like we're knitting too tight, that we start loosening up our grip on the yarn and the needles and try to knit looser. If you find that you're knitting too tight, you need a bigger needle size. If you try to alter how you do things with your hands, you're just kind of stressing out your knitting and you're making things uneven and, you know, it's not something I recommend. However, I did this not even knowing that that's what I've done upon the knowledge that I had been knitting with one stitch too tight. So looking further down here, I can see even that it is looser than it was up here. I don't think it's visible to anyone else. It's just, I know that. It'll probably be a little bit tighter just around the bust and probably looser a little bit further down. So maybe it will look like it has a subtle A-line shape. And I'm not mad about that. At the end of the day, I think it's working out as long as I can keep with my current tension. We're all good. And that is usually what I do anyway. I just think when I was knitting sort of this area, first of all, I was at a yarn festival and I was traveling a lot. I was on trains, I was on planes. You know, it gets maybe a bit denser then. I don't know. But I think I was skipping a little bit out on my float managing technique where I sort of push the stitches on my left hand needle apart just to check that the floats are just right. I kind of was skipping a little bit out on that. Once I returned to my usual technique, I think that was the point where we returned to that kind of old tension that I was supposed to have. Don't break what's not broken, I guess. The moral of the story, I don't know. So yeah, here you can see the stick for the armhole that I have now bound off. Uh, so that means I can put in some crochet reinforcement. I don't like that it's called that, but you know, that's what it's called and we can cut it open and pick up stitches around and work them down, which I would much rather do than sewing in sleeves. Uh, I did do that for, for Kosakofte because Kosakofte is made in that very kind of typical way. And, uh, you know, I wanted to have a cardigan that had that because it has a lot of really nice methods of hiding the steaks and things like that. It's really pretty, but I'm not looking for pretty here. I just want to get it done. <laughs> And I do think it's more enjoyable. And also I tend to procrastinate sewing in things and putting knitting together if I have to, you know, seam and, and stuff like that. So the less I have to do that, the more likely it is that I will actually finish. And what's better than that, you know? I am very pleased with how much progress I made because when I picked this up in Oslo and Hamad, I had probably all just worked it just under the neckline, maybe like down to here. And I noticed when picking it up and trying to get to the underarm, it was slow. I'm like, I, this is not growing fast. But as I got into the zone, into the rhythm of it, I am just knitting this without thinking now. And it's just, it's just growing. There's maybe like halfway through on the body now, if we measure from the underarm, because I'm going to put rib on it as well, obviously. Anyway, this is made in Vilje by Hillesvog. That is also the recommended yarn and colorways in the pattern. So, so far I am following it to that extent. I am using the same chart. I'm using the same yarn. I have sort of roughly got the same kind of neckline, though I do think I have a lot more stitches, but generally, and, and I am using the same sort of dimension and stitch count and things like that. I'm just turning it upside down on its head because I wanted to make this top down, not bottom up. So, and I'm enjoying it. I, I want to be clear, by the way, there's nothing wrong with how it's written. Uh, you would probably enjoy it just as much if you follow the pattern. I just, at the end of the day, I'm just fussy about how I construct things. I want to do it a certain way that I make sure that I'm going to finish it. I think I just said that, but just thought I'd clarify. Right, so we are on to the final work in progress and kind of sort of a segue between my works in progress and my stash acquisitions because I got a bunch of yarn, <laughs> of course, and these two yarns I wanted to hold together and make a very quick knit sweater on the biggest needles I have in stash. It's not quite the biggest needles, but not too far off. And they are Roma Fienöl, the good old Fienöl, and Roma Alpaca. Wow. Roma alpaca lean, alpaca linen. I just know English it that a bit, but this is yeah a alpaca linen blend. I'm gonna read from the labels because I know it has a bit more to it than that. So yeah, this is the label, alpaca linen. It has 48% baby alpaca, 8% wool, 44% linen, and that's the exact same meterage as Fienel, which is 175 meters per 50 grams. But I think this is considered more of an iron simply because of all the fluff it has. And so when you hold this together with phenol, you're getting quite a sort of considerably chunky yarn. So I bought four of phenol, I bought four of alpaca lean, 
and I have held it together and cranked through it and have an almost finished pullover already. It's gonna be a design and you're gonna laugh at me now, but it is a completely basic raglan jumper, which I swear, I swore, I did swore past tense, that I would never do because I have, my issue with raglan is I find that if you do them completely like as raglans are supposed to be done, that you can't give the same yoke depth proportionately to each size. It will end up being a little bit too shallow and tight neckline for the smaller sizes and too deep and wide neckline for the larger sizes. And that's not the same fit for all the sizes, which is very important to do in a pattern. And I aim to do that in all my patterns. However, I found a way to do it on this very chunky needle raglan that we basically do a little bit it sort of things a little bit different when you get to the underarm, just to make sure that we have both the right depth for the armhole, the right neckline opening for all the sizes, the right sleeve and body circumference across sizes so that the amount of ease is fair and even across and just all of it. Wasn't actually that tough. So I'm very pleased with it. So saying it's a basic raglan, yes, uh, it looks like just your run of the mill stuck in a raglan. But of course I have to finagle with the numbers to make sure that it is, you know, all sizes fit equally well. And this is a oversized, fluffy, airy, warm pullover. Let me hold it up to you on the right side and hopefully it's not too dark for you to see because it's very, very burgundy. Surprise, surprise. I find that when you hold together fluff yarn with a sort of main yarn, the fluff tends to dominate the color and the main yarn kind of pokes through every now and then. And my goodness, do I love it. I feel like I managed to replicate somewhat of the colorway in the viola yarn in that color shawl that I made. It looks quite similar. It's probably not gonna come across that way on camera. I'm gonna need to blow out a bit so we can see it. Yeah, so that's, that's that. Will obviously look better when blocked, but yeah, it has like kind of you shape the neckline opening before you join the round just about here, which I find is a really nice way of doing raglans because putting in short rows and raglans can be really nice, uh, just as nice, just as good, but a little bit more confusing. Oh wow, that looks lovely. Look at that. Look at the marled effect of these two colors. I am, oh, I just love it. And then you got these sleeves that are. You know, nice and roomy, but not too roomy. They're just sort of, again, nice. They're just big enough that you can have it over whatever else you're wearing, so there wouldn't be a problem laying this jumper over the one I'm wearing, for instance. And sometimes I want that. I just want some knitwear that doesn't require me to have to plan the entire outfit. And here I am on the second sleeve, close to being done as well. And once I've done that, I will continue with the body so that we have just the right length and I'm not gonna run out of yarn or anything like that. Very much enjoying making this. It's been such a quick knit. It definitely kept me co company during my COVID days. Also, I was watching Yellow Jackets while knitting on this. And if you don't mind a little bit of spookiness and, and gore, that's a show I can highly recommend. It was I, I can't wait for the next season, let me just tell you that. But yeah, you can hear the needles kind of going, <laughs> they are big. I'm using 10 millimeter needles, which to me created a 11 stitch gauge. And uh, that's about a US 15 needle size. It's a quick knit, it's a very quick knit. It's got the working title, get warm quickly, because that was really the motivation for me to make this fluff beast, is that I just want something that I can make ASAP before it gets cold, which I mean, I didn't make it quite in time, but you know, I will. And you know, just pull over whatever else I'm wearing that day. That isn't, you know, part of the, the outfit, it's just, you know, to have a wearable blanket, if you will, just. So yes, this basic raglan will become a pattern. I have succumbed to the basic floofy raglan. I, I have no excuse. That's just, we all need a basic raglan in our repertoire. Uh, next thing will probably be a two by two rib hat. What do you think? <laughs> now, I want to talk about Stitched with Arma and my experience there. It was lovely. I was just really pleased to be there as well as it was in Harmad, which is very close to where I used to live. Like, it must've been like 12 years ago, 13 years ago. It was lovely. Like I said, I got to spend Lots of time with friends. I shared a hotel room with my friend Emilia of Arctic Yarn. That was really, really nice. Always fun to hang out with. And I had a talk. So I was initially invited to this, like even before this, I don't know what I'm trying to say. Basically I was asked early if I wanted to give a talk. And when I was given any option, I was like, yeah, gauge. I wanna talk about gauge. I could talk about anything else. I could've just made a talk about my designs if I want. No, 
I want to talk about Gage. And I even had people signing up and paying for it. So you imagine that, people actually do want to hear about Gage. Isn't that great? And it was probably the world's least serious talk on Gage. It was mostly internet memes and me just like cursing swatches and saying I don't believe in them. So, you know. Uh, I feel like I should replicate this talk to become an online course of sorts. Uh, I have to think about that. I think it would need somewhat, you know, different content. Obviously being in English, so that would be a thing that would change. It was really weird to talk in Norwegian, talk knitting in Norwegian. Like, I could find the words. That actually wasn't a problem. It was just like... I'm so used to talking about this stuff in English to a camera and now I'm just like talking in my own dialect to people. Yeah, so that was a thing. But I really enjoyed it. I had a great audience. They gave really interesting questions. You know, they paid attention and were like curious. And it's just like the kind of audience that you want for these kinds of talks. So that was great. Uh, thanks for showing up if you happen to be watching. I mean, I'm assuming some of you guys probably watch this show. So yeah, I would love to do stuff like that more. I only have good things to say. It was really nice to see a lot of familiar faces again. I feel like a lot of us have had this experience of the online knitting community lately where changes in Instagram and algorithms and things like that. And obviously having been in lockdown, we haven't felt so connected in a while. And Going through these shows and these events and knit alongs in person again is really reinforcing that community sense that we have had. And it's helping me feel inspired to design more and publish more. Just feeling like, yeah, there is an audience for it. There are actually people who are asking, hey, where have you been? You've not posted a lot. Like, you know, things like that. That it's just like, oh, right. And yeah, it just helps to feel that community sense again and the reasons why I do all this stuff. I can't really put into words just how nice that's been, but that's always the thing that strikes me when I go to these shows. So I just want to give a massive hello to everyone who were there and I, who I talked to. Uh, thanks for, you know, uh, all the, the loveliness. And I now want to talk about the things I got there. This is for two festivals. This is not as bad as I have been in the past. This is Unique Strik, which you can probably guess means unique knit or unique knitting by Inga Semmingsen and Sigrid Marie Blum. I had to get it because their designs are just really interesting and unique as the title say. I don't think that's a, a misnomer at all. I am, I will say I'm less familiar with Sigrid's designs, so that's going to be really lovely to explore in this book, but I am familiar with Inga's designs. I have knitted one of them and seen a lot of them and I'm just in awe. Like, how do you come up with this stuff? Like, if you're like really looking at someone else's work, you're like, I wish I'd thought of that. That's when you know it's, it's good. You know, it's like, how did you do that? That's, I think that's a mark of really excellent work. I had to get my mitts on this this book. And uh, I mean, you got this jumper, which I don't actually think this is color work. It's some kind of slip stitch magic. Now, as you may remember the t-shirt that I knitted off Inga's a while back, there's now a pullover version that I feel like I must make. Will I have time to? do it is another question but look at that the puff shoulders and everything right i need this in my wardrobe i think we can all agree on this both a color work yoke and a puff shoulder design like how how did you do that i mean i've done it now so i know how it's done but like i could not get my head around like what that design process must have looked like that that is very off the grid of like kind of how we construct most things so i'm just like yes Yes, this is, oh, I like this. And yeah, this is the jumper that first got my kind of eye up for Inga's work. This cables and collar work, and it's just, yeah, I need that. The, one day, one day. There's even a yoke version, and you know, which is great, except now I have to decide which one to make, so. Maybe I'll do the yoke. So yeah, hopefully that gives you a little bit of a taste of, of these patterns, this book. But I do believe, even though this is a Norwegian publication, that you can find some of these patterns individually online in English. I just don't know which ones, but some of them. So chronologically speaking, we're going a little bit back and forth here simply because of how I wrote things down when I planned this episode for some reason. I both went to Stitcherama where I gave the talk, where I bought that book. But the yarn that I bought for the Get Warm Quickly jumper and this yarn I actually got from Garntopia. Now Garntopia is a yarn shop in Oslo that I honestly will say is very quickly shaping up to become one of the best yarn shops in Oslo. It was quite new the... It was the first time I went, the last time I went there, I'm not quite sure. And it's very much like if you love the silk mohair jumpers that are still all the rage in Scandinavia, 
you know, that's the shop for you. And that's, that's kind of not really been my thing, although clearly, I mean, now I'm making a big fluffy alpaca jumper. I guess I do like, and I am thinking of designing more Sigma hair stuff, so. But also this shop, in addition to having all this lovely Sigma hair collection, uh, selection, is having a considerable amount of Roma yarn and Sumner's yarn. So it's catering to a lot of different knitting needs as well. And these yarns go really well together. So you don't have to like plan across yarn shops and stuff. So yes, I got both Fenul and the Alpaca Fluff and lots of Silk Mohair in the same shop. Awesome. And so for some reason I came home with a little black Fenul. I don't know why. <laughs> if I'm gonna design something in black, I guess I just, Thought I needed that in my life. I wear a lot of black, so might as well. I don't even know if that's enough for one garment. So what I was thinking has to be just decided because I, I don't think 300 grams is enough. Other lovely yarn that I came away with from this shop is more of this Isager silk mohair. I already have, I think like five skeins of this. And I just realized if I get another three, I can make a bigger silk mohair garment than I had initially planned. And I have like this image in mind now that maybe a design, I, d I don't know. We're definitely in the oversized region now. I clearly just feeling like the big boxy pullovers these days. So I, I now have more of this. Now the final yarn that I came away with from Gontopia is more Isage Twinny, which is kind of funny because I used to have a lot of Isage Twinny in my stash that I eventually de stashed because I didn't know what to do with it. And now I bought more, so. But I have this idea in my mind of a jumper in these lovely colors and I... So what we have here is one and a half skein of black and we have a blue, a green and a sort of blue green so these will go together with the black i think the black will be the main color which is why i wanted to get an extra 50 grams just in case and we'll see what comes of it and that's that um if you want to know anything about twinny it is just 100 percent non-superwash wool so these are 100 gram skeins they have 510 meters each which is quite a lot so yarn is quite fine i might knit it to a just slightly tighter gauge than my usual 24 stitch gauge it might be like dabbling in 26 there if that means anything to any of you but this is this is the little hole there this can be a jumper so i guess i bought yarn for three jumpers in just one shop i don't seem to be doing accessories these days don't am i just like it's all garments and arguably i'm planning on having more garments than any reasonable person would ever need but big shout out to gontopia it's an absolutely lovely yarn shop it's huge it's got lots of yarn it's got a really cool cafe right next to it with cinnamon buns i mean what more could you need it's also conveniently close to where one of my best friends live in oslo right now so like i was just you know could not complain and yeah Back to the yarn festival that was north of Oslo. I did come home with some yarn. I actually bought one sweater quantity and one, I guess, shawl quantity. So let's let's start with the shawl quantity. This is lovely, lovely yarn. This is from Istabu Gul, which is a yarn dyer in Norway that gets a lot of yarn from Hillesvog and dyes on them. And some of the bases are not something Hillesburg offers. You have to get it from the, the diary. And this is one of those because this is pelt wool. So normally with Hillesburg, the pelt wool comes in, like you got sölje, that's kind of a fingering. You got tinder, that's kind of a DK. And you got varda, that's sort of more on the worsted iron side. And then you got blåne, that's chunky. But Hillesburg kind of started off being known for having yarn like usk, which is just a regular wool, which is sport weight. But that weight has never been produced with pelt wool, except this yarn is more sport weight. It's not like Solia, which is finer. It's not like Tinder, which is thicker. It's sitting somewhere in between. And so of course I had to get my mitts on that. And I fell for this lovely blue color here. It's a little bit sort of denim blue and a little bit out of my usual blue range, but I have been feeling like I need more blue shawls lately. Let's have a look, look, see at the label. So yeah, these are 315 meters per 100 gram skein. And yeah, it's in pelt wool, it's hand dyed, it's beautiful. I can't believe I haven't talked about this yarn on the podcast before, but I have now. So you now know about Istanbul, good. Now, as with most yarn festivals, Stitcherama had its fair share of amazing yarn dyers and it's hard to narrow it down to just one. Like who am I gonna, you know, come and take home away yarn from whatever, who I'm gonna buy from. And I decided to buy from someone who, you know, whose work I admired for many, many years, but I actually haven't knitted with her yarn yet. And that is Fable Knitwear. And I bought a whole sweater quantity worth 
of this gorgeous navy yarn. I believe the colorway is Astronomy Tower and it's on DK weight organic merino. It's non superwash. I thought this was superwash. It's non superwash DK weight merino. 225 meters on 100 grams and it looks plump. Like this yarn just looks plump. Like I would almost say that this is leaning on worsted weight, which is not bad considering the meters. Just lovely. This is the Fable Knitwear logo. I'm sure you are familiar with Helena's Fable Knitwear creations. She's got amazing vintage style patterns. So I was like, well, this is gonna have to be a design. So I'll see if I can do something with pop shoulders. So we have a bit of crossover there and uh, that's kind of the idea there. So thank you so much, Helena. This yarn is gorgeous. The base is called Elder, by the way. I'm gonna have fun with this one. So have I committed to a lot of jumpers now? Yes, perhaps, possibly. So yes, that about wraps up my experience at Stitcherama. Uh, there's so many wonderful experiences. I'm sure I can't even mention all of it, but yeah, just good vibes. But yeah, it was absolutely wonderful. I really hope they repeat the success in future years. I would love for this to be a regular thing. Uh, big shout out to the organizers. You guys did a great job. And now I want to talk about Yarndale, which happened two weeks later in Yorkshire. So that was like kind of a quick train ride away from here. My goodness, it's gonna be a long episode. Uh, I was already gonna go uh, for a day's trip the way I normally done, but then Lola of Third Volt Yarn asked me if I wanted to join and help out in their booth. So why not? I've never really done any sort of work like that on a yarn show before. I usually, you know, I've, I've given talks and classes and stuff, but actually standing in the in the stalls and selling stuff, I was like, yeah, sure, why not? And uh, my goodness, will I never take for granted the sheer amount of work it takes to set up a stall, a booth, what have you, at a yarn show. Wow. <laughs> but once we got it up there, it was it was it was happening and it was really fun uh lots of you guys came up to the booth and said hi so hi it was really nice to meet you uh we were also opposite susan crawford so you will see that reflected in some of my acquisitions it was really lovely to see susan and her family again uh we also had kind of just opposite that katie green where also my friend Angela was helping out and that was really, really nice. Again, it's the same thing with Sishirama. Like, it's so lovely to meet people who, like, I haven't seen in ages and people, like, you feel connected to the knitting community again. Like, when I say community, it doesn't mean, like, you need to have, like, a kind of quote-unquote card-carrying membership. It's just, like, oh, you're a knitter, you're aware of other knitters, congrats, you're in the knitting community. And is that, like, awareness of us other knitters when you go to these events? That That's kind of, like, what I'm talking about. And that is just lovely to like, and especially for me, like I've been doing this for so many years now, like I go there and I realize like how many people I know, even if it's just simple, like, hey, like it's just amazing to me how I know so many people from just, you know, these shows and <sighs> anyway, I was selling some of my patterns there. So I got to bring some samples. We suggested some of Lola's yarn that could be used to make some, some of the single color sort of DK weight patterns of mine, like the Sinkestra pullover and the Cherry Puff pullover and the Ispre as well. And I had my print patterns, which I've never sold print patterns before either. So now I have a pile of the ones that I didn't sell that I don't know what to do with. Uh, so we'll have to think about that. Maybe there's some yarn shops that want to do kits. Uh, let me know if you happen to run a yarn shop and you want to do that. But anyway, let's just get straight to the acquisitions. I could talk about Yarndale forever. It was lovely. Yarndale, for those of you who don't know, is up in Skipton in Yorkshire. It's massive, like good luck with, with seeing everything there in a day, honestly. It's it's really cool, it's very varied, it attracts a lot of different people, serves a lot of different like kind of craft needs. It does not just, you know, it's not just all people selling yarn, it, it's so many different things. I love the area, I love going up north. Every time I go, I'm like, why don't I live here? Like, oh, this is amazing. And lots of need for knitwear, which always makes me happy. And yeah, I managed to take a few little sort of loops around, you know, leaving Lola to, to deal a bit alone. <laughs> I could just kind of have a little, you know, peruse and see what I wanted to buy. And I already knew that I wanted to buy some Laxton's DK weight BFL Massam because, well, said sock knitter and I wants to have a go at shawl blanket things, which is ambitious, but we're not gonna, you know, it's, it's gonna happen. So I got some yarn there. So that's not for me, so it doesn't count. And I thought, you know what, this is a really nice way to buy things. You just buy things for other people, so it doesn't count. So I got this lovely project bag. 
This is from Soft Accents and it she makes these really cool knitting project bags in these kind of Ankara fabrics which said uh, sock knitter going shawl knitter really really likes so I thought perfect gift and you know I don't need more project bags so this was gonna be for someone else it's fine it's fine except I kept carrying it around putting my yarn in it and getting kind of attached to it so I came back the next day <laughs> and bought the same one again. So this is now going to be a gift and I will be keeping the one with the red accent because of course I had to keep the one in red. So this I have now given away, it's no longer mine. It was just, you know, left here for yarn skeining purposes. This is the Laxton BFL Massam. So we're not gonna talk so much about this because it's not mine. It does not add to my stash, neither bag stash nor yarn stash. So nice little loophole there. So I don't have two identical bags. I, I only have this one. It is lovely. Like I said, from Soft Accents, can highly recommend. Really, really lovely bags. Great size. As you can see, it can fit a lot of skeins, even though it looks quite small on the surface. Let's talk about the yarn. At the end of the whole show, having talked to everyone and myself and all sorts, um, I went and had a chat with Susan about her new lovely yarn and we discussed some you know designing yarn collabs and I got to pick a few skeins to take home with me to decide on ter in terms of like what I want to design with and how many skeins that she can send me to make a garment or accessories or what have you and I will be taking an opportunity to talk about these new yarns of hers because my goodness my goodness it's like yes I am still grieving the you know UK loss of all my favorite yarns like the you know, we used to get a lot of Doma yarns in the solder shop. There used to be, you know, a lot of options in the UK for getting Norwegian yarns. And now they're just kind of is it. What's exciting is that a lot of Susan's yarns are kind of scratching that itch for me. On top of that, the color palette is like, she's read my mind. Yeah, I just lay the skeins out on my table. So you can now see the bag without any content. And I'm now going to try sort through the different yarns that these are because they're not the same. Um, we're gonna have to start with the sock yarn. This yarn, we're gonna have to talk about this yarn. I don't know why Susan hasn't like screamed in my ear that she's made this yarn already. I had to go and see it for myself uh, because this is the yarn that I've always wanted. Long time followers of this podcast, we're talking really like veterans here, will know about my kind of hang up about why we can't really ever get the perfect sock yarn. So what I mean by that is like most sock yarn has about 400 meters per 100 grams. They're made of wool and they have about 20 to 25% nylon. Like that's like gold standard sock yarn. But they're all superwash, which I get. But I like to do color work socks. I would love to have that yarn, but in rustic non-superwash wool. We're talking wool and so we're talking with a bit of like bite to it. I have tried to talk so many different mill owners. Like I've just walked up to these dudes and be like, listen, and I've got this close, but it's like not quite the right weight or it doesn't have nylon or just something like that but Susan has gone and done it. This is the yarn. There's like nothing, I have nothing to say like, oh, it could be thicker, it could be thinner, it could have that, could have that. No, this is it. This is this is what I wanted and it exists. And uh, so I will be designing with this, rest assured. There will be at least two, if not three sock designs coming out of this because it's a lot of yarn. So let's read from this. Lock sock yarn, 75% pure lonk, 25% nylon. It has 378 meters per 100 grams. So not quite 400, but close enough. I'll take it. This is the Hogarth colorway that I'm holding up here. This is the Undyed Angelica. And this is Foley, which is a fantastic shade of burgundy. And there are like several shades of burgundy and turquoise, squoze, squoze, well, teal. I could have just said teal and made my life easier, which are some of my go-to colors in knitting. And they're still, you know, undyed for all those color work needs. So a little close up here, like this is perfect. This is all I ever wanted. And I'm sure some um, people are gonna mention like, well, what about Tukey Wool Sock? And yes, Tukey Wool Sock has been the probably best option. It is a little bit thicker, which is why I'm kind of going ballistic over this because it's closer to a usual sock weight. I love Tukey Wool Sock, it's just that it's more sport weight. So using it on a whatever sock pattern out there, you usually find it gets a lot denser. Nothing wrong with that, just worth knowing. I'm, I'm losing my mind over this. 
I'm not even much of a sock knitter, but if I am, I want to make it in proper woolly wools. Like imagine like these Norwegian color work socks, I'll be doing this, it's gonna, it's gonna be good. Now, the other yarn I want to talk about is Susan Crawford's barn yarn. I have talked about that yarn before and it is a pattern coming in that yarn. I know I have been tempting it for like three years now, but it's actually around the corner. I photographed it in April. There's really nothing stopping me. I just kind of want to get some help with the right up of the lace because I know that not everyone loves charts. I don't get it, but I know it. And so I want to make sure the write-up is as good as the chart. I've had a friend test knit it based on just the chart alone and a photo of the shawl. So I know it's very easy to follow and it knits up very quickly and it's lovely. But I want to make sure the write-up is, is good before I launch it. So hang tight. Um, but yeah, let's talk about the yarn. This is barn. This is barn in DK. This is barn in fingering weight. I have to laugh when I actually, I got to kind of just pick wildly from the shelf and start working from these and let Susan know which ones I want to design with because I'm going to do garments, guys. I would, I'd be garments with this. So let's start with this because this is, I had to laugh when, when I picked this because this is the yarn that I have been using for the shawl. Now I happen to have another skein. I thought contrast color, right? So I do color work with this. Like imagine something in these colors. This is again my just favorite shades we got burgundy we got teal say no more so read a bit from the label so susan crawford's yarn is called a room of my own so in case you were confused like why does it say that that's susan crawford's yarn this is the barn dk maybe that's not the name of the sorry the fingering weight is called buyer i'm not sure i'm pronouncing that right but that's not called barn it's buyer barn however the dk weight 225 meters per 100 grams this is the berry picking colorway this is the dry stone wall colorway and this is hidden depths ta-da i guess i have uh, sort of talked myself into doing at least two garments which honestly try and stop me i'm such a weird sleeve knitting kick lately and so given that i'm always on a kind of yoke kick whatever construction that is just anything that's like the, the top torso where you figure out the neckline and sleeve and armhole all that stuff i always want to do that and now i I'm on a sleeve kick, so I get the sleeves done. If you've already done those parts, sleeves and that yoke, it's not a lot left. So now I'm just like cranking out the garments. It's probably the reason I'm finishing so many of my old ones. But yes, let's look at buyer. So I picked slightly different colors here. I mean, obviously I had to pick a burgundy. It's also berry picking. I also got this lovely red. I would, I, this is still on my burgundy rainbow, honestly. This is the room of my own colorway. Look at that. Oh, this, oh, yeah. And then I just picked this wild card because I thought this would contrast well. This is a nice pop. And the colorway is covered wool, moss color covered wool. So that's that. So this is the sort of barn bundle here, the two different weights. So I won't be using them together, although that's maybe that's a new path to venture down. Oh, oh dear. I am very excited about this. I feel like, yeah, like I said, it's covering a lot of the need that I have for working with rustic yarns. And, you know, on top of that, it's fostering more collaborations and all those things is all good for you know knitting shenanigans hopefully we can get some kits coming from that which is always good but now i'm all talking no action so let me wrap up this episode in a bit and start knitting but the last thing i want to talk about before i do that is susan corpus evolution book but of course I had to get my mitts on because I already have Susan Crawford's other three books. I'm such a fan girl. There's lots of lovely patterns in here. I don't know where to begin. We can start with the one on the back. On the mood, which, I mean, does this one have my name on it or what? It's very like Shetland meets Norwegian Lusikov there. It's got this shawl here that is lovely. And it has the orchidea... Uh, don't ask me to pronounce it. This one, which I am actually knitting on. But there's no time to talk about that. So we'll talk about that next time. It's got this lovely vest. And I really want to have a go at this hat because they look some, like there's some construction that will, you know, tickle my interest there. So this is basically a take on a lot of the patterns from the Shetland Vintage project over here. Hence the name Evolution. So that's, that's that. I am, um, yeah, like I said, very happy to have it. I don't really have a lot of time to knit other people's designs. I'm mostly trying to finish up my old whips and do my own designs, but there will be probably more than one knit from this book, I would imagine. Having a lot of fun with it already. And yeah, I, I, I made it. This is probably going to be half an hour longer episode than usual, but I hope you all enjoy that. And I probably won't even be that long until I come back next, because there's just so much knitting happening now. And we'll talk more about... I have. I just have a lot of things I want to talk about in terms of knitting and grading and fit and gauge and a lot of those nerdy things that you all sign in here for, because I think whether we are knitters or designers or whatever else we do in this craft, we're all kind of invested in stuff sitting well, you know? So... 
fitting, all that stuff, and all these things to play into it. Stay tuned for that, I guess. And thank you so much for watching. Do sign up to my newsletters if you, sorry, that's singular, my newsletter. If you wanna hear more about all these things I just rambled about and wanna hear about it in time, and yeah, I want to subscribe to this channel if you feel like it too, because then you find out about when these videos come out. And yeah, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye.